The Trinity is a foundational doctrine in the Catholic and Protestant churches. But is there biblical proof for the Trinity? The Catholic clergy says no, but the Protestant clergy says yes. But logic and reason tell us that both can't be right, so who's right and who's wrong? Let's get to it. Is the Trinity in the Bible? The long and short answer is no. That's not true. My pastor said that Genesis 1:26, Matthew 28:19, John 1:1, 1, 1, and 1 John 5, 7, and 8 all mention the Trinity. Well, let's see if this is so, shall we? But first, let's not forget the definition of the Trinity from my last video. Now, Christendom teaches that there are three separate co-equal co-eternal persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit that aren't each other, yet they are all one God. Now, do we agree that this nonsense is the current definition of the Trinity? Good. Now, let's read Genesis 1.26. And God said, let us make man in our image and likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Aha! The Trinitarians exclaim, This is proof of the Trinity! But where is the definition of the Trinity in this verse? It's not there, is it? Uh, yeah, I don't see it either. The personal pronouns of us and our can be any number between two and infinity. So it is the context clues that will determine whether or not us and our are three separate co-equal co-eternal persons. But to be honest, the context clues in the surrounding verses don't shed any light on who the Lord is including when he says us and our. But my pastor said, Well, there's your problem. My pastor said, oh, We are here to see if what he says is so. Yes? Well, there you go. And to be honest, it's not panning out very well. Now, I feel our emotions are getting the better of us, so we need to put our emotions in check here. Let's take a moment to breathe, huh? Three deep breaths. Three deep breaths, Laytel. Okay, that's better. Now, from here on out, let's remember to use our third person perspective so we can think clearly, not emotionally. Ready? Here we go. To shed some light on who the us and are could be in that verse, let us search the scriptures. Oh, according to scripture, we know that there is only one God in heaven and that he, singular pronoun, is enthroned between the cherubim, which are angels. But since God is literally one God and he became a man, Jesus, that means that Jesus is also our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And wouldn't you know it, see how he was standing between the cherubim that are on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant? Now this is an excellent illustration of that reality. Now speaking of reality, Oh look! Big Poppy is impersonating God Almighty. You see how he has enthroned himself between the cherubim? Now, I wanted you to see that even the Antichrist here knows the truth. Hm. He even looks like he's guilty, huh? Anywho. 
we clearly see that God travels with two angels when God goes to see Abraham and Sarah to tell them they will conceive and bear a son, Isaac. And God confides to Abraham what he is going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. He also told the Exodus artisans to make the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant to have two cherubim on the cover, as we've already seen, right? But there are more heavenly visions like the one in Ezekiel when Jehovah rides his amazing throne chariot. The verses Numbers 789, 2 Kings 1915, Psalm 80 verse 1, and Psalm 99 verse 1 also tell us this truth. Yes? Yes? Okay then, you tell me. By using scriptural evidence, is it more likely that God is including his heavenly escort, the angels, in the Genesis 1.26 verse? Or is it more likely that he's talking to two other God does who are not mentioned anywhere in the text or the entire Bible? Uh, but... The angels didn't help create the world. The Bible says that God the Father created it all by himself. No one helped him. Oh. Oh, indeed. So yes, you are right. The angels didn't help God make anything. But neither did the other two implied God does, who are never mentioned in Scripture. Now, it's like when I tell my boys, we are going to make a pie. Even so, I assure you that I have no intention of letting them help me. I simply include them out of politeness or acknowledgement of their presence, that they are in my family and will receive the benefit of my pie-making skills, which are pretty good if I do say so myself. Now, nothing mysterious or hard to understand there. Now, undoubtedly, there are Trinitarians who will insist that the Shema found in Deuteronomy 6.4, which is pitifully obvious as to there being only one God, is not referring to the empirical number one, but is speaking of a group as one. Now, the Hebrew word echad can mean one of something singular or plural, as in a group, but this is again implied by their imagination, because a group is not supported by the text or surrounding verses. So even if the Shema implied one group of three gods, which it doesn't, then a plurality of gods would still be present in that one group, thus making the triune god polytheistic. Uh-uh, that's not true. Uh-huh, it is true. And I'm sorry that you can't admit to the idolatry in your mind and heart. Oh, that's harsh. Maybe, but it is true. Now, moving on to the claim that Matthew 28:19 is ironclad proof of the Trinity in the Bible. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The three titles here are cited as proof of the Trinity, but in what way are the three titles of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be considered as the one and only singular personal name of God, as the text so plainly says? Yeah, not a clue, huh? That's because the one and only name that represents God's titles is Jesus something the apostles perfectly understood, which is why they baptized people in the one and only name of Jesus. So those of you who have been baptized with those three titles, you need a do-over. Hello? Yes, do you perform baptism in the name of Jesus only? Smart lady. 
And now let's read the supposed Trinitarian proof text in John 1, 1 together. Ready? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have God and the Word as subjects here, but there is no mention of the Holy Spirit, so this is not Trinitarian on the get-go. The Apostle John may have been inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these lines to refute the very philosophical nonsense that has hijacked it, the Logos allegory. Now Philo lived during the same time of Jesus and the Apostles, by the way, and John may have been well aware of his philosophical cockapoo-poo, especially his Logos misinterpretation. Pagan Greek philosophy and mysticism that came from the likes of the P Amigos here is what made Logos into a lesser god, like Hermes is to Zeus. Now that is why Christians assume that Jesus pre-existed as God the Son and was floating around with God the Father in heaven. So now let's consider verse 3 with the knowledge that Logos is normally understood to be spoken words. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. We see this in Genesis 1.1. God the Father, Jehovah, literally spoke this world and everything in it into existence. In Hebrew, the word for spirit is ruach, and it means breath, wind, or spirit. So when God speaks, his very spirit is put into action, and what he says comes to pass. So when God told Adam and Eve that he would bring about a savior, a man, to save them from their sin, his very words were spirit and life, and they would come to pass thousands of years later through a virgin girl from the line of the tribe of Judah. The very breath of God, which is life, said it would be so, and it was, and is. Now this is why Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now this is a good spot to have a hallelujah breakdown. God's Word? Let's continue. The next proofed text is 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, yes? Finally, a proof text that has some semblance of the Trinity definition, or does it? Now let's read it together, but let's start with verse 6 for context. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Looks like ironclad proof, right? Uh, not so fast. Now, if you have a study Bible like I do, then there should be a note there, like my Bible has. Oh, I don't care if John MacArthur has been a pastor for decades. That doesn't impress me in the least. I absolutely don't agree with what John MacArthur says about the Trinity being present in these verses because the Bible doesn't support his flim-flam. But I'm going to read his commentary to you anyway, because, well, you'll see. It says, quote, These words are a direct reference to the Trinity, and what they say is accurate. External manuscript evidence is against verses 7b and 8a being in the original epistle. They do not appear in any Greek manuscript dated before the 10th century AD. Only eight very late Greek manuscripts contain the reading, and these contain the passages in what appears to be a translation from a late recension of the Latin Vulgate. Furthermore, 
four of those eight manuscripts contain the passage as a variant reading written in the margin as a later addition to the manuscript. No Greek or Latin father, even those involved in Trinitarian controversies, quotes them. No ancient version except the Latin records them, not the Old Latin in its early form of the Vulgate. Internal evidence also militates against their presence, since they disrupt the sense of the writer's thoughts. Most likely, the words were added much later to the text. There is no verse in scripture which so explicitly states the obvious reality of the Trinity, although many passages imply it strongly. So we can plainly read that this man, John MacArthur, has testified that these verses are a direct reference to the Trinity, which is his allegorical opinion. But then he candidly admitted that these passages have been added to the original text of the epistle from a late recension of the corrupt Vulgate and is not to be found in any Greek manuscripts dated before the 10th century AD, which is why none of the Greek or Latin fathers quoted from them, and internal evidence also militates, that's a fancy word meaning emphatically not possible, that these verses were original to the text since it disrupts the writer's thoughts. But in the same paragraph, he stated that the additions are accurate? Says who? Philo of Alexandria? Now, dear one, that's called denial. Or crazy strong delusion. The man just said that part of verse 7 and verse 8 that claim to teach the Trinity don't belong there yet says that they explicitly state the obvious reality of the Trinity, although many other verses strongly imply it. Do you realize what this flimflam man just said? Uh, no. What? John MacArthur just said said that the Apostle John and the Holy Spirit of God are liars, and that Philo of Alexandria and all the fake and phony church fathers are telling the truth. That makes John MacArthur a false teacher extraordinaire. I know, dear one, it's always shocking and sad when a wolf has been spotted among the sheep, but the work of a heretic hunter is never easy. Now, let's read verse 9 and 10 of this chapter just for kicks, huh? If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he had not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. Now, Going by these verses, it makes it clear that John MacArthur is a false teacher, because he refuses God's word in favor of the words of men that were added to scripture to promote the nonsensical philosophy that distorts scripture with its pagan allegorical symbolism, which implies that God is three separate persons, plural. Uh Uh-oh, she's on to us. Now, the witness of who Jesus is, the Son of God, is the subject here. Nowhere do we read about God, the Son, the second member, of the Trinity. We read about Jesus, the Son of God, who is eternal life. 
Trinitarians not only accept the Son of God, which they should because he's in Scripture, but they also worship God the Son. So they are idolaters and have the wrong Jesus and therefore don't have eternal life because God the Son is never mentioned in Scripture. So let's read all of these verses like they should be read, shall we? Now this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made God a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has the life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Do you hear how these verses now make sense? And do you understand what the Apostle John is teaching? That God became a man. That is what the Son of God means. It is a reference to Jesus' deity. This is why searching the scriptures with an objective and open mind and seeing the truth in scripture is so important because our prize of eternal life is at stake here. Now I am deadly serious here, dear one. I wish I could make you understand and even be as passionate about this topic as I am. Now if you claim to love God and you believe in the Trinity, then you need to get serious about your faith. It's time to decide who you will listen to, God and his word of truth, or men and their allegorical fables. God is still searching for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Are you one of them? Now, I truly believe that this past year has been a time of tribulation for us, the Bride of Christ. Many of us have been separated from our churches. It's like we are being called out into the wilderness as sheep with no shepherd to be alone with our God so he can get us to listen to him as he talks gently to us with his word, the Bible, where it plainly states that he is the one and only true God and that his plan from the beginning was to become a man, Jesus, to die for our sins. So, is the definition of the Trinity in the Bible? No. You will find its definition in the creeds of men, who formulated it over hundreds of years, with the help of Philo, that Jewish Hellenistic philosopher from Alexandria, Egypt, the ancient home of false teachers and its fabulous library which burned in 48 BC as collateral damage from a tactical fire Caesar started, and its lighthouse, which was one of the seven wonders of the world, a pharos of knowledge, until it was destroyed by several earthquakes, a testament to the frailty of human knowledge. So again, is the Trinity taught outrightly in scripture? No! Is it taught and heavily implied and even defended by false teachers like John MacArthur and others? Philo of Alexandria's legacy of false teachers with beautiful minds, all of whom embrace the lie of the Trinity? Yes! So it looks like the Catholic clergy is right. The Trinity is not found in the Bible. Better luck next time, Protestants. Peace out. Now 
Darren? If John MacArthur doesn't repent of his faith in the Trinity, then according to these scriptures, he is not saved. And when he dies, he will reside in outer darkness, where he will await his sentencing to the lake of fire. <laughs> Getting through to you. Now, if not, then there are plenty more videos coming where I will seek to convince you. And I hope you will join me on my continuing mission to see if what they, the so called Christian clergy, say about the Trinity is so. Bye-bye for now. Whoa, oh, that Philo dude. What a trip, man. Yeah, the Trinity. <coughs> Far out. Are you improvising? I had to redo that. I was not happy. Choo choo went by and oh, where's my glasses? There you are. Hold on. Oh, turn the toilet. Nah. Where he will await his sense to. Sense. 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 Sense